APGO basic science topic, hemorrhage. In obstetrics, postpartum hemorrhage is common. The WHO reports postpartum hemorrhage is the leading cause of maternal mortality, accounting for 35% of all maternal deaths. In severe cases of hemorrhage, it is important to consider the diagnosis of disseminated intravascular coagulation. In this video, we will review the basic principles of normal hemostasis, review the physiologic changes associated with coagulation during pregnancy, and review the pathophysiology and management of DIC. Please meet our patient, Ms. Heim. She is a 35-year-old gravida 3 para 2 at 36 weeks gestational age with chronic hypertension. She presents with vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain to labor and delivery. On exam, vital signs are notable for blood pressure of 100 over 60, pulse of 98. Abdomen is tender to palpation, and on pelvic exam, there is significant clot in the vagina with active bleeding from the cervix. Tachometry demonstrates uterine tachycystole. Labs demonstrate a hemoglobin of 8.5, platelet count of 240,000, prothrombin of 12.8, activated partial thromboplastin time of 27, and fibrinogen of 450. Her symptoms are concerning for placental abruption, and she is presenting with abdominal pain and bleeding. Let's look more closely at her labs. What specifically do PT, PTT, and fibrinogen measure? These labs are useful to assess clotting function in patients. PT measures the extrinsic pathway of the coagulation cascade and includes factors 7, 10, 5, and thrombin, which is also known as factor 2. PTT measures the intrinsic pathway. An easy way to remember this is that it includes all factors except for 7, including factors 12, 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, and 2. Both pathways converge to form thrombin and subsequently fibrinogen, which is cleaved to form fibrin necessary for clot formation. Let's take a look at normal hemostasis to truly understand the role clotting factors play in clot formation and why coagulation labs are helpful in determining if coagulopathy is present in our patients. In normal hemostasis, a platelet plug first occurs at the site of injury. This is a blood vessel with epithelial cells. When injury occurs, platelets adhere to the site of injury with the help of von Willebrand factor. At the same site of injury, tissue factor is released. Interaction of tissue factor with factor 7 initiates clotting and is considered the primary event of the cascade. This subsequently activates factors 10 and 9. Activated factor 9 combines with activated factor 8 to activate factor 10. Activated factor 10 with activated factor 5 generates a small amount of thrombin. The small amount of thrombin activates platelets as well as factors 5, 8, and 11, which leads to the application of thrombin generation, the so-called thrombin burst. This propagation accounts for the majority of thrombin generated. In addition, activated factor 12 activates 11 on the surface of activated platelets, which provides an alternative route for generation of thrombin. Let's take a moment to review how clotting factors relate to PT and PTT. I'm circling what is considered the extrinsic pathway, which again is measured by PT. And this is the intrinsic pathway, measured by PTT. Let's pause, read, and apply. Patients with hemophilia A have factor 8 deficiency. What lab findings would you expect for PT and PTT in a patient with this disorder? Since factor 8 is part of the intrinsic pathway and not the extrinsic pathway, we would expect an increased PTT and normal PT. Let's continue with the cascade. Thrombin then converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Fibrin monomers are then cross-linked by factor 13 to form a clot. What keeps a clot from propagating indefinitely? Termination of clotting is an important step in normal hemostasis and also prevents clotting when it is not required. Thrombin stimulates the activation of antithrombin. Through negative feedback, thrombin and 10A are inhibited. Similarly, tissue factor pathway inhibitor inhibits tissue factor. Protein C is also activated with the assistance of protein S. Activated protein C then inhibits factor 5. Finally, the clot is removed with the activation of plasmin. Plasminogen binds fibrin and tissue plasminogen activator, which converts plasminogen to proteolytic plasmin. Plasmin cleaves fibrin, releasing fibrin degradation products, and D-dimers. Let's remember our patient. Now that we know what the labs are measuring, what is normal for pregnancy? During pregnancy, there is an increase in some coagulation factors and decrease in some anticoagulation factors to decrease excessive bleeding postpartum. The changes create a relative hypercoagulable state. Procoagulant factors fibrinogen, factors 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13 increase by 20 to 200 percent. In addition, there is a decrease in anticoagulant protein S and antithrombin. 
other proteins such as C, 5, and 11 remain relatively unchanged. In pregnancy, the placental bed plays a role. Decidual cells that line the placental bed strongly express tissue factor. When this is released at sites of decidual trauma, initiation of the coagulation cascade occurs. These factors, along with myometrial contraction, all contribute to decreasing the risk for excessive bleeding at the time of delivery. Factors typically return to normal levels 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. And how does this affect labs in pregnancy? PT, again measuring the extrinsic pathway, generally stays the same with no marked changes. PTT, measuring the intrinsic pathway, is usually shortened by up to 4 seconds in the third trimester. In addition, fibrinogen is markedly elevated, with normal levels ranging from 350 to over 600 mg per deciliter. Let's go back to our patient. She continues to have heavy vaginal bleeding. In addition, repeat vital signs demonstrate a blood pressure of 80 over 40, pulse of 120. Labs are also redrawn. Her hemoglobin is now 7, platelets are 70,000, PT is 15.5, PTT is 39, and fibrinogen is 250. What is happening to our patient? She is hypotensive and tachycardic. Her labs are consistent with anemia and thrombocytopenia. She has evidence of coagulopathy as PT and PTT are elevated and fibrinogen is low. In severe cases of hemorrhage, it is important to consider the diagnosis of DIC. In DIC, the processes of coagulation and fibrinolysis become abnormally activated within the vasculature. But what is the underlying pathophysiology of DIC? The typical sequence of events is as follows. Endothelial damage may cause release of procoagulant enzymes or phospholipids. Activation of the coagulation cascade leads to production of thrombi in the microvascular and or larger vessels. Extensive formation of thrombi in turn leads to consumption of platelets, coagulant, and anticoagulant factors. Rapid consumption of factors outpaces their production, creating a consumptive coagulopathy with impaired coagulation. Fibrinolysis is activated at sites of thrombus formation with generation of fibrin degradation products such as D-dimer. Large amounts of degradation products interfere with both fibrin clot formation and platelet aggregation, causing impaired coagulation. Tissue or organ damage may result from reduced perfusion, thrombosis, and or bleeding. Labs demonstrate thrombocytopenia, hypofibrinogenemia, increased D-dimers, and prolonged PT and PTT. It is important to note that obstetrical complications are common causes of DIC, including abruption and fetal demise, amniotic fluid embolism, preeclampsia and HELP syndrome, and postpartum hemorrhage. Let's review the underlying pathophysiology. In placental abruption and fetal demise, there is significant injury and necrosis of fetal placental tissue, increasing the release of procoagulants. In amniotic fluid embolism, amniotic fluid rich in procoagulants and anticoagulants is released into the circulation. Preeclampsia and HELP contributes to endothelial cell damage, which activates coagulation. Hemorrhage can lead to shock, resulting in severe tissue hypoxia, resulting in release of tissue factor from damaged cells. The treatment of DIC is focused on correcting the underlying cause, maintenance of volume status and supportive measures, and replacement of blood products. Replacement of products is justified in patients who have serious bleeding or at high risk for bleeding. Red blood cell transfusion is necessary for severe bleeding. Platelet transfusion should be given if platelets are less than 50,000 with serious bleeding. Coagulation factor replacement should be given to patients with severe bleeding who exhibit signs of coagulopathy. Let's go back to the clotting cascade to see how replacement products correct coagulopathy. Fresh frozen plasma contains fibrinogen and all coagulation factors. Cryoprecipitate, on the other hand, has a smaller volume and is rich in fibrinogen, factors 8 and 13, as well as von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor helps platelets adhere to the site of injury. Let's pause, read, and apply. If you suspect DIC in a patient, what lab studies would support this diagnosis? Labs consistent with DIC include increased PT and PTT and decreased fibrinogen and platelets. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on hemorrhage. In this video, we covered normal hemostasis, physiologic changes associated with coagulation during pregnancy, and the pathophysiology and management of DIC. Thank you.